All right, good morning, Elkview Baptist family. Thank you, choir. I'm going to give you guys a second to get trickling in here. If you guys look in your bulletins, we have a lot going on. Not necessarily this week. As a reminder, we do not have any services this Wednesday night. There's no Awana, no teens, and no adults this Wednesday night. So enjoy your time over Thanksgiving with family. So no service this Wednesday. One announcement I am excited about, if you look in your bulletin on the left side, we have a church family volleyball night on December 1st. So that is exciting. So if you enjoy playing volleyball, come out and play. If you're like, I don't really play volleyball, that's fine. Come on out and play. We're going to have a good time. As it says there, we're going to have some pizza, some drinks and snacks. We're going to have some things for kids to be playing as well. We may even pull out the giant six-foot beach ball so that the kids can play with the adults and we can do a big game like that. So we'll see. We're just going to have a fun night playing and enjoying our new volleyball system in the church. So come on out to that. And then at that, we'll also talk about the upcoming volleyball that we do with other churches. We'll kind of give you guys some more information on that and kind of getting that started back up this year. Also, we have a upcoming uh, business meeting for the church on December 3rd, uh, 3rd December 3rd, our annual um, business meeting. So um, the proposed 2024 budgets are back on the information desk. So if you are a church member and you want to look that over beforehand, you can grab you a copy of that and take it and look it over, and then we'll have the um, meeting on December 3rd. We will also have the upcoming uh, church officers and things posted here in the next week or so, so that's coming down the line, so you'll be able to look at that information as well. Well, when you pulled up this morning, you may have noticed a trailer sitting outside. That is our new, um, we're calling it an emergency response trailer, but also it's kind of a construction trailer. It's a multi-purpose trailer um, that was donated to the church, and we wanted to thank um, Tammy Garten, and a lot of the tools inside came from her dad, and so she was able to donate that for the use of our uh, just construction projects around the church. So we wanted to thank Tammy and her, her dad for all those tools. So thank you, Tammy. Um, but that trailer will be used whenever we take supplies for flood relief or anything like that. We've actually used it a couple of months ago when we did our flood relief and took that down to a church. We loaded that thing up and took it down. And anytime the church is working on projects or taking uh, emergency relief things to different places, we'll use that. So we're very thankful for that. And just look at your bulletin. We have a lot coming on, uh, coming up. We have Christmas parties. We have our uh, Christmas cantata. All these different things happening. So just keep an eye on your bulletin for all of that. Okay. Catch my breath for a second. And then we'll open in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we are able to come into your house. And we are able to worship you. Lord, we are excited for what you have for us today. And Lord, we just pray that we would honor and glorify you through our worship this morning. Lord, we pray that as your word is opened, we are just encouraged and challenged to grow closer to you, to serve you more daily, and to love you better. As we sing our songs of praise and worship, help us to lift up our voices and just magnify your name and glorify you and just worship you for who you are and for all that you have done for us. So Lord, we are thankful that we have the privilege to praise you Lord, help us to not take the opportunities we have to serve and worship you for granted. Help us to live our lives in praise to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you, and it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.
morning. I'll talk in the microphone so you can hear me. Good morning. <laughs> um, sometimes it's hard to catch sometimes the, the words of a song, <laughs> especially when it's new. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, you're more than enough for me. Jehovah Rapha, you're my, you're my healer. By your stripes, I've been set free. Jehovah Shammah, you're my, you are with me, and you supply all my needs. You're more than enough. You're more than enough for me. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning? His grace is enough for us every single day of our lives. We're going to start off singing, This is Amazing Grace, once I get over here to the piano. <laughs>
great singing this morning. You can be seated. Good morning. The word cheerful appears only two times in the New Testament. One of those times is in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, where God lets us know that he loves a cheerful giver. And as we think about giving to his church, which in the context of that verse is talking only about his church, not other good purposes around the world. But as I heard those songs, I thought, wow, hearing about God's grace makes it so much easier to give cheerfully. And over the last few weeks, um, the deacons and church finance committee have been working on the church budget for 2024. And one great blessing we've had as a church family here is that over the, the period of COVID, the giving of this church didn't drop, even though attendance did drop. However, as we've worked through looking at the budget, other more difficult things have come up. That thing called inflation uh, puts challenges on our operating funds here at Elfie Baptist Church. So as we pray, think about that. Think about uh, how God loves it when we give cheerfully. And just think about that amazing grace that motivates us and makes it easier to give cheerfully. Let's pray. Father, what a blessing you are to us. Uh, Lord, the joy that we can experience because of your amazing grace that flows through Christ. Uh, Lord, what an awesome, awesome blessing it is just to contemplate that. Lord, we would pause and ask for the many needs in our church family. Lord, as we pray here this morning, as each of us think about the, the physical needs, the health needs, the spiritual uh, distress that some people feel. We pray, Lord, that you'd minister to those needs as each of us bring them up to you at this very moment in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We're blessed by the songs that we've heard this morning. We look forward to hearing the word preached by Pastor Charles. We just ask your Holy Spirit to lead and guide his every word and thought. And Lord, again, we, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Thank you so much, choir, Sounds of Grace, Marvin, 
Sherry, thank you so much. You know, um, we're blessed each week to be exalted in music and um, have our minds directed. I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Samuel this morning. When I was contemplating um, the message for this week, uh, I've been working for a little while on a uh, thought <clears throat> of why we should stand with Israel. And it would be a broad-based um, message from Scripture of why we as a nation and why we as individuals would, would stand with Israel. And, and uh, I will bring that message, but I just couldn't um, do it this Sunday. I felt as if we are launching our Thanksgiving week, and uh, I know our church stands with Israel. And, and so just know that's coming. I, I'm imagining the first Sunday of December. Um, you won't want to miss that message because there are some points that I'm, I'm quite sure might be um, new information. And um, I think um, I'm just excited about that, and I want you to be aware it's coming. And um, also this morning, um, we're breaking for the week of Thanksgiving. Pastor Josh and I will both be out of town from Wednesday to Saturday. Uh, Pastor Curry's preparing a message for next Sunday morning. Now, we'll, we'll be here, but he'll be the preacher next Sunday. I didn't want us to go a week without prayer. So the up-to-date prayer sheet is in the lobby. It's on this yellow paper. You'll find it on the welcome desk, that nice rustic wood desk out there. And uh, some folks have some procedures coming up that are pretty imminent. So I wanted to make sure we didn't stop praying throughout the week. Um, something that's not on here that I learned this morning uh, Tina Thaxton and John will be traveling this week back to Cleveland for yet another procedure. So they're not yet on this list. And then the Hawkins family, um, Trampus Hawkins' dad passed away last night. So um, keep that family in our prayers. And you can pick this up on your way out. And church members, you can pick up a copy of the budget that's posted. Now, with our Bibles open to 2 Samuel, it's very obvious we're talking about God's grace this morning, and there is a wonderful illustration built into the Old Testament that pictures God's grace. It's just a, it's an illustration of the New Testament example of how the Father's grace flows to us through Jesus Christ. So, we'll get started here this morning. Thomas Jefferson, I'm told that um, he would go horseback riding in the countryside, and he always had an entourage around him. And one particular day, they were riding through the countryside, and they came to a creek that was swollen, or a small river that was swollen uh, a bit more than usual. And uh, several in his party crossed over, and the president was still held up on this side. And a wayfarer, you know, he hailed the president, and he said, would you carry me to the other side? So President Jefferson pulled him up onto the back of the horse. Across they went. History records that once they got to the other side, one of the men said, why did you wait to hail the president to carry you across? And the, and the guy goes, president? I had no idea that was the president. I just looked at you guys, and most of you had no written on your face. He had yes. He had a yes face. Thomas Jefferson had a yes face, it was said. Well, you might say that on that day, Thomas Jefferson demonstrated grace. He met a need to someone he didn't know without condition. You know, grace can mean many things in many different contexts. We've all heard the word. Grace can refer to the movements of synchronized ballet dancers. Grace can also refer to the college classroom when a particularly difficult test was given and the teacher grades it on a curve. But more importantly than those ideas associated with grace, we want to come to the biblical meaning, because the word does appear all throughout Bible. We want to come to the biblical understanding of unmerited, undeserved favor, a special favor extended to someone who doesn't deserve it, did not earn it, and cannot repay it. 
So the illustration of God's grace in the Old Testament is, is just that. Someone who didn't deserve it, um, they didn't earn it, and they certainly couldn't repay it. With that in mind, let's read chapter 9, verse 1. Follow along, please. The Bible says, David said, he's King David now, he's no longer on the run. He's just a few months into his kingdom. David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him to David, the king said to Ziba, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I should show the kindness of God? David is just a few years into his kingdom, and he asks this question, is there someone? Is there someone from the house of who, church? Saul. Now think of that. Think of the years between David's anointing from the prophet of Samuel and the years that David was a, re, a, a fugitive. He first served in Saul's court. He did nothing but good for the man. Twice a javelin was thrown at him. The king tried to kill his own musician playing music in the king's court. Then David's on run for his life and he's being hunted like a dog and Saul's pursuing him instead of pursuing the enemy of the Philistines. And you think of this, that David sought an opportunity to find a descendant of Saul to encourage. What a, what a profound illustration of grace. You know, God's grace is like this. It seeks an opportunity. David indeed made the first move towards this person we're going to meet in just a moment. This descendant of Saul. David made the first move to rescue Mephibosheth. And similarly, grace, God's grace, seeks an opportunity. Isaiah the prophet said, Ho, everyone who's thirsty, let them come to the fountain and drink. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save those which are lost. God's grace seeks opportunity to express itself and bestow upon an undeserving person something we didn't earn, something we can't repay. David went out of his way to ask, is there anyone left of Saul's house that I can minister to? When and where are we being like this in our Christian journey? If we're the recipient of God's grace at salvation, where are we the givers of grace? Where we go out of our way to seek an opportunity to minister to someone who's really not going to be able to um, reciprocate. God's grace seeks an opportunity. But not only that, I see something else. God's grace is different. It has to be differentiated from man's normal means and methods of kindness. Now, I'm sure you all understand that in the um, history of that day, during this dispensation in time, going back into 1000, 2000 B.C., in the Near East, when a king would take over a kingdom, um, the previous um, princess and the previous uh, potential heirs were, um, well, let's say they were rounded up and they were, um, they were put away in a way that they would never have a claim to the throne. Most of the time, there was a mass execution. There was a great slaughter. And that is indeed the culture of the day. That's the tradition of that time. But God's grace is different. Would you notice again in verse number 3? And this is how our Father deals with us. 
David is saying, I have something from above to give away. I want to show not the kindness of David. In verse 3, he says, I have something that's different. And I want to show a nation something that's different. I want to show myself who is enjoying the grace of God. I want to show myself that I can be different than vengeance. I want to show someone who doesn't deserve it the kindness of God. Oh, the call to be different is right here, my friend. The call not to seek vengeance. The call to have a different mindset. The, con- the kindness of God, it just, it causes the kindness of man to wilt and to pale. That we would show kindness to the descendants of a hostile family that put us on the run for about seven years threatened our life on many occasions. What a beautiful illustration that God demonstrates his love toward us while we were still sinning against him. He loved us, pursues us. God's grace is different. I'd cause you to notice this verse on the screen here. I think I'll finally get to it. It's from Isaiah. It just talks about how different man's ways and thoughts are from God's thoughts. Isaiah 55 verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. What does the Lord do when he sees the wicked turning to him? Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will, what? What will he do? Abundantly pardon. God doesn't just forgive you a little bit. He forgives you as far as the east is from the west. He removes our sins from us. God is capable of kindness and mercy and grace. That's beyond what we as people give to one another. His mercy endures forever to those who love him. The psalm teaches us that. But it says here, God will abundantly pardon. And then here's the point. God's grace is differentiated. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. Are you struggling to forgive anyone today? Are you struggling to forget a wrong of the past Well, here we are right here, God's grace. David had it all done to him. Oh, my goodness, what abuse. And he says, is there somebody that I can show that out of this world kindness that God has birthed into me, I want to be more like Jesus Christ. God's grace is to be differentiated you know, man, forgive, man struggles with forgiveness and forgetting, but God does both. Glory. So we see more in this text. This is illustrating God's grace. God's grace seeks an opportunity. God's grace is different. But God's grace will extend an invitation where there otherwise was really no invitation. Now, I want you to just imagine with me Mephib- Mephibosheth's plight. We'll read a text. Actually, let's just look at it real quick right now. It's not going to be on the screen, but it's chapter 4 of the book you're in, 2 Samuel 4. And I want you to imagine with me Mephibosheth's plight. It's a few years after David's taken the throne, and he's lame. Now, how did this come about? How did this, his damaged legs occur? In chapter 4, verse 4, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. Saul and Jonathan died in battle at Jezreel. Mephibosheth's nurse took him up and fled, and it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. So years earlier when This boy was just five years old. Perhaps the nurse, he wasn't moving fast enough. Perhaps she was shoving him to get going. Perhaps she picked him up to carry him 
They tumbled down some steps. We don't know, but the boy fell, and there was injury enough that he's paralyzed. He's lame in his feet. Now, start to develop that scenario from a young child. You knew you had a king who was your granddad named Saul, five years old. You can understand that. You heard a little bit about Saul's exploits. You also heard about Saul's enemy, David. You also had a daddy named Jonathan. Jonathan had a perspective that was shared. And now your nurse grabs you up and is rushing you out. You end up tragically injured and you're growing up and you're hearing Jonathan's gone, Saul is gone, but you're hearing regularly from your handlers, those who are keeping you alive, those who are keeping you in hiding. You're hearing regularly a scenario, a story about why you must lay low and be hidden away. You think that story's positive? Probably not. Grace, God's grace, extends an invitation to some very unpositive mindsets. Now let's go back and read verse 4 through 6 of the chapter we're in, chapter 9. So verse 4 says, <clears throat> And the king said to Ziba, Where is Mephibosheth? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amil in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought Mephibosheth out of the house of Machir, the son of Amil, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said to Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. You know, God's grace sent, extends an invitation. David sent and brought Mephibosheth to his palace. Now, I want you to think about this. The greatest example of grace is when someone is greatly disadvantaged, someone really has no way forward, there's no forgiveness that's going to matter except the forgiveness that I can grant them. This is the greatest picture of grace. No one in Israel could approach this boy with the kindness that David could approach him with. To coddle a exiled prince from a former regime could be misinterpreted. To flee for one's life and lay low, okay. But to coddle and exalt and promote them, no one could show that grace except David himself. And David extends the grace that only he could show. Church family, can we not see? Can we not see the lowly place that the Lord visited us? And no one could extend to us our sin. And we have all sinned. And we have all fall short of the glory of God. And our sin is against him and him alone alone. He is the one whose forgiveness ultimately matters. And he extends an invitation out of that penalty. He says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is, what church? Eternal life through who? Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace, marvelous grace. Grace extends an invitation and then I would say to you that grace, grace must be received. It must be received. And I want you to notice what begins to happen. There is reception happening as Mephibosheth consents to come see David and responds to David. Look in verse number 7. So David said to Mephibosheth, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake. And will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Now think of where he was in Lodabar. 
And think of what is being laid out. Amazing grace. (laughs) What an elevation. What a gift of God. What a freedom. My chains are gone. I've been set free. What a transformation. The old man is made new. But this grace, look what it has to be received. It has to be received. Look at verse number 8. Then Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, What is your servant that I should look, that you should look upon me, a dead dog, such as I am, a dead dog? Well, grace must be received, very simply. Now, in just a moment, we're going to pivot to a very important passage of Scripture. So I want to encourage you, if you have your Bible, it won't be on the screen, but I want you to go to Ephesians 2. We'll read it there in a few moments. Ephesians 2. But God's grace must be received. David said these words. Mephibosheth, he said, first of all, do not fear. I will show you kindness. Then the third thing, I'm going to restore your granddad's estate. And then the fourth thing, by the way, you don't have to stay on that estate. You were invited to a spot perpetually at my table. Amazing grace. Grace has to be received, my friend. Mephibosheth had two contrasting stories rumbling around in that head of his. Here he is as a uh, older teenager, maybe in his or maybe his early twenties. Probably he's probably a teenager. He's got two contrasting stories. You know what I find today that people have many different views and stories about who God, our creator, must be. Who Jesus Christ really is. But I'm going to tell you what, my friend, when the contrasting stories that Mephibosheth had, was he going to believe his granddaddy? Or was he going to believe his daddy? Was he going to believe his uncles? By the way, the book of Samuel says that there were many descendants of Saul still living. David didn't go hunt them down. They're listed later in the book of Samuel. David didn't gather them up. And actually, when David said, is there not yet one of Saul's household? The implication was, I'm looking for someone from Saul's household who has need and may be receptive. How about that? The implication is he was looking for a needy descendant of Saul. There were others out there. There's just a few chapters later in this book. My point is this. Grace has to be received. Mephibosheth had uncles that may have dropped in on him and been poisoning his mind about the view of King David. And I would say there is a media, there is an internet, there is all kinds of half crack theologians that are constantly spinning some concocted unbiblical view of who our creator is and I want to tell you my friends I'm so glad for truth we draw our view of God's identity from the Bible it is the preserved word and I'm going to anchor all my view of God to scripture not circulating theories. Mephibosheth had a decision to make. Would he go with Saul's view or Jonathan's view of this king? And I have news for you, my friend. You know that whoever accepts the king's invitation gets a warmer reception than David was able to give Mephibosheth We get a warmer reception in eternity. You know, David said, first of all, don't fear. Think of the fear this man lived in, hiding in Lodabar. I want to show you kindness. Here's your grandfather's estate. Matter of fact, let that be managed for you. You come on over and you hang out in my palace. Grace must be received. Well, what did Mephibosheth do? We, we know what he did. He accepted this wonderful salvation, this wonderful grace. You know, it's said of something here that Jonathan, 
as Jonathan would have influenced uh, that young mind at three years old, four years old, five years old, before Jonathan died, it is said of Jonathan in the same book that Jonathan loved David as he loved his own soul. There was a conveyed understanding um, that David is a man after God's own heart. I love that brother. I serve with that brother. Matter of fact, was it last week we preached about Jonathan's exploits in war? Was it last week? Yeah, it was. And I wonder where David and they seem to be cut out of a little bit of a similar cloth. Was there not a guy named David that uh, a little around that time, a little before that time, he went out with a slingshot and took out a big guy named Goliath? These two warriors were warriors publicly, but they were warriors with God Almighty privately. They knew his grace. They knew his love. They knew his covenant to Israel. And they were able to walk strongly and courageously. And they, they loved each other. You know, and I'll just make a comment right here. I want to just, just point this out. The, there are um, liberal theologians that say this. This has been around a long time. That um, David loved Jonathan as he loved his own soul. Oh, these guys were homosexuals. They were in step together that way. They were romantically in love. And I would just say, you know, that, that invention, that theological twist. Let me say something to that because Titus 1.5 nails it down. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled, nothing is pure. Even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Oh, may God help us not twist the scriptures of his holy word. These men had an awesome friendship. And they understood God's grace. And Jonathan passed on an idea about the king's love towards his son now our bibles are open to ephesians 2 because grace must be received and i want us to look at this passage together this will put you on shouting grounds at least it does me <laughs> ephesians 2 verse 4 follow along but god now think of the contrast mephibosheth has come out of low to bar he is now invited into the palace mephibosheth is saying i'm a dead dog but I'm here. I'm ready to bark. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Take me out of this misery. I'm thankful for what you're doing, king. Now think of the cross. Look at this. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, I'm in Ephesians 2, 4, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Raised us up together. Made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That in the ages to come, the Father might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Is that not a New Testament, a parallel to the Mephibosheth story? Wow. How did you get saved, my friend? How did you come into the family of God? Ephesians, and you're already in chapter 2. Look at verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been, what church? Saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We could just start singing right now. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. My friends, God extended grace. And Mephibosheth had to simply believe and accept the king's grace and accept the offer. And he was immediately elevated out of his former status and just bestowed with so much blessing and benefit. Adopted, if you will, into the king's family. 
That's what grace does. As we acknowledge, I am such a needy person. I am lowly. I am not going to take the alternate views of God and the alternate opinions of his character. I am not going to peddle in the, in the, um, in the false theology. I am going to look at God beautifully as he gave his love letter. And I'm going to accept his grace and let him elevate me. Grace has to be responded to, received. Mephibosheth receives grace. Now let us go on. Our time is getting close. Grace is covenantial. Grace is covenantial. And you would say, well, <clears throat> every illustration only serves as a vehicle to help us understand truth. And it's not a perfect illustration. But I want to show you a covenant David made. And it gave the segue into showing this kindness on this day to Mephibosheth. So it's on the screen, 1 Samuel 20. Uh, it'll be on the screen, 1 Samuel 20. And hold your spot in Ephesians, by the way, because we're going back there. 1 Samuel 20, verse 14. And you shall not only show Jonathan, Jonathan is talking to David. This is sometime before the battle of Jezreel where he lost his life. Jonathan's talking to David, and he's asking for a covenant. <clears throat> and you shall not only show me the kindness, who is it? The kindness of the Lord. These men both had understood God's kindness and grace and favor, and they weren't afraid to ask each other to live up to it. As we experience God's salvation, kindness and grace and favor, let us not be afraid to stir one another up to live up to it. Verse 14, And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. Did you see that? Jonathan said, Give me a covenant, David, that not only will you be kind to me as you take over the kingdom but you will be kind to my house forever. God's grace is covenantial. Now we can go back um, to, we'll be in Ephesians in just a moment. Jonathan uh, said to David, you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. And David made that promise, made that covenant with Jonathan. He not only made that promise to cut off, but he went beyond that promise when he brought Mephibosheth into the palace and when he restored his grandfather's estate, David went far beyond just merely sparing his life. He showed him extreme God's grace out of this world. You know what that reminds me of? Turn now to Ephesians 1. God's grace is covenantial and we're fast coming to the conclusion of this message. Are you understanding God's beautiful grace? Through the cross of Christ in the empty tomb? Are you seeing it a little bit more? I want you to see the covenant we're in. Parallel the covenant back there in that Old Testament. Look at this, Ephesians 1, verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. Why would God do this? According to the good pleasure of his will. It just pleased God to adopt us to the praise of his glory of his grace. Grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Do you ever feel like you're not really accepted? Well, my friends, get the biblical idea from the word. You've been adopted through the cross in an empty tomb. You have been elevated from the position of a low, debarred sinner to a child of the king. We're adopted. And he said, guess what? In case you don't understand it, that means you're accepted in my family. That's what Ephesians preaches. Go down to verse 13 in Ephesians. 
In Christ, in verse 13, Ephesians 1, in Christ you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having believed, you were, what does it say, church? Sealed. Now we got the Trinity kicking in here. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. He said, I've adopted you. Now I'm sealing that decision through the Holy Spirit. And by the way, I'm depositing him within you. God's grace is covenantal. He's got you if you've come to him as a sinner needing forgiveness and called upon Christ. You aren't ever going to fall out of the family of God. So let's call on one another to live up to the beautiful grace bestowed on us. Well, I'm encouraged this morning. Are you encouraged? I want to close with the last point. Um, <clears throat> this, it's on the screen. God's grace is fickle. It's fickle. It's here today. And it might be gone tomorrow. No, that was man's grace. I'm sorry. I got that word wrong. So, what happened with King's table <clears throat> in 2 Samuel 9, verse 13? So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. He was in Lodabar. <laughs> he dwells in the holy city. Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. You can read the other verses. We didn't read from that chapter, but Ziba. And his sons and Ziba's servants managed Saul's estate. Made Jonathan a wealthy man. But that was not as good. The gain in wealth was not as sweet to Mephibosheth as the grace of the king. He decided to stay at the king's table. He didn't need to retreat to that private estate. He ate continually at the king's table and was lame in both his feet. So as I wrap this up, Listen carefully. Mephibosheth stayed near the king's table. In spite of our lineage, in spite of who our granddaddy is, God gave grace. In spite of our position, I'm a dead dog. Jesus Christ adopts us. In spite of our imperfections, I'm a cripple. The Holy Spirit seals us into a covenant and is deposited into our lives. I want you to think about the king's table as we close. Ammon, one of kings, David's sons, was there. Ammon in the Bible is depicted as a very clever and a very witty, a very brainy guy. He thinks through strategically his decisions. Ammon was there with that acuity. Is that a word? I'm sure someone will let me know. Absalom was there. Absalom was um, what you might call a pretty handsome dude. He had long flowing hair. Um, beautiful guy. Handsome guy, I guess, is what you would say. Then there was at David's table regularly General Joab. Oh, Joab was... He was tough. This dude was made out of muscle and he had masculine characteristics completely. He was not in touch with his feminine side. He was, he was a man. You had Tamar at David's table. This refined, pure lady. Beautiful. They're all sitting around David's table. They're ready. It's time for another get-together. The family's here, but we're waiting. What are we waiting for? Clunk, clunk, clunk. Yes, Mephibosheth. 
He's almost here. He's part of the family. We're waiting for Mephibosheth. And that's how grace looks. When David showed grace to Mephibosheth, it cost him Saul's land. When our father adopted us into his family, it cost Jesus his life. We're inheriting far more than a piece of land on earth. We are inheriting a home in heaven. So I'm asking us as we go out this Thanksgiving and we gather with our families or our friends this week, let's remember that in Christ, we're the recipients of this marvelous grace. And may our Father increase our capacity to be grateful and to give grace to others. Are we wearing a grace face today? Are we able to forgive those who've wronged us? Are we able to be generous when God prompts us to those who they haven't earned it? Are we wearing a grace face? Let's stand together with our heads bowed. Have a moment to respond. Heads are bowed, the altar's open. Pastor Curry's coming here. If you're here today and you say, I want to stand in God's grace. I want to know what it is to be his child. Would you come take Pastor Curry by the hand? Our heads are bowed. We're just going to privately as we can have a moment for response. If you need to be saved, would you come take Pastor Curry by the hand? If you just want to come and just appreciate God's grace more, the altar's open. While the music plays, you just do business with the Lord. Love on Him. Thanksgiving is here, and it's time for God's people to be grateful for the grace bestowed on us, the elevated position we've been given, the freedom that is right, it's imminent, it's right at our doorstep in Christ. We need to receive more and more of the grace available. Yeah, there's saving grace, but church, there is what we call sanctifying grace. Grace to live with. It elevates us constantly while we live. Would you receive more grace today? Our invitation's open. up here we're going to sing as we're dismissed and I just want to be maybe the first to say from Elkview Baptist happy Thanksgiving have a blessed week remember someone in our church family as, as several of us are traveling out of town some may be stuck here without family and let us remember to be in touch with them extend them invitation as we're dismissed we're going to sing of course here we are